And indeed, we are now recording. Welcome, everyone. So great to hear have you this morning to our uh, for our session entitled "Accessibility in Your Canvas Course." I'm Dave Giberson, uh, an old instructional design coordinator who used to work for Online Learning Pathways and who's been called back from retirement to help with the transition to Canvas. And today I'm doing some training. Um, it's great to see you all. My goodness, we have five attendees now. That's tremendous for the first day of class. Um, let me go ahead and share the our course syllabus with you, or seminar syllabus. Uh, first, I'll put a link to it in the chat tool. There it is. You can pull that up if you like. I'll share it with you here now momentarily. I can find out what I did with it. Just a sec. There it is. Okay, now I'll share it with you. So oh, as expeditiously as possible this morning, because we have a good deal of information to cover. <clears throat> We're going to look at accessibility from the standpoint of your Canvas course. We'll start out with some introductory material on what accessibility is, why we need it, um, and deal with some basic questions about uh, how to make your Canvas course accessible. And then we'll look at specific issues of ex web accessibility um, and try to give provide as much practical information as possible about how to, uh, to address these issues in Canvas. And finally, uh, and although probably interspersed with the rest of this, we'll also look at some helpful tools that you have available to you uh, for free that will help you ensure accessibility of your Canvas courses, including uh, the Canvas Rich, con the Accessibility Checker and the Canvas Rich Content Editor, uh, Office, Microsoft Office's built-in Accessibility Checker and all of their applications, and a new tool that is newly available in Canvas um, for Canvas pages called the Microsoft Immersive Reader, which is really cool. I really want to save time to play with that. It is really cool. All right. Um, I will be sharing my screen most of the day. Um, if you want to have this outline available to you for any reason, you can just click on that link that I just put in the chat tool. The uh, this outline should come up in a, win in a separate window, and you can minimize that window to see the rest of the presentation and bring it up at any, bring it back up at any time, if, should you so desire. All right, I'm gonna pull that away and pull Canvas over. I have made a little sandbox course for us this morning to play with. I've got a little bit of content in there already. Um, but first, let's go back to the outline for a second. First, talk about what accessibility is. Well, accessibility is basically a fairly simple concept. The idea that all of your students should be able to uh, successfully uh, access and use the material that you put online for them in Canvas. That's a narrow definition from our standpoint, but uh, um, and they should be able to do this regardless of uh, their um, level of capability physically, mentally, since uh, um, and the 
in a sen, uh, sen, <coughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Any sensory, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Any sensory issues that they may have. Let's face we all face it, we all have issues. Those in a, we all have strengths and weaknesses, these would be physical, mental, and sensory capabilities. And um, it's important to address issues with that type of accessibility in any online course uh, in order to ensure that all of your students have access to that. That's the good reason why everybody, why your course needs to be accessible. The less uh, positive reason that it needs to be accessible is that's the law. It's a matter of federal and state law and SDCCD board policy. Anything that we put online for educational purposes has to be accessible to students with disabilities and varying, let's just say varying capabilities. I hate that word disability. We all have varying degrees of abilities and this online material needs to be usable by and accessible to all of us. Uh, who benefits? Thus, the obvious answer to that is everyone. Students with certain disabilities absolutely need your content to be accessible and usable. Uh, but all of us benefit from that. Shoot, I can't watch a movie nowadays without turning the captions on. Uh, even if it's in American English, and God forbid I turn on Acorn and pull up uh, people from Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and all around the world with accents that uh, you know added to my diminishing uh, hearing acuity, I can't really enjoy much uh, in the way of video anymore without captions. So we all benefit from the from you building accessibility uh, elements into your courses. Of course, in order to be for your courses to be accessible to your students, the first requirement is that the platform that you're presenting them on itself be accessible. And we're in pretty good shape as far as Canvas is concerned in that regard. Uh, no learning management system is perfectly accessible. Indeed, almost no content is perfectly accessible. There really isn't a, an option for perfection and accessibility because varying capabilities are so varied and so different from person to person that we're never going to hit perfection here. But we want to be as good as we possibly can. And Canvas is pretty good. It's uh, uh, certainly not, uh, certainly the way that Canvas presents information, the tools that are provided, the, um, the interface itself is better than average, certainly among learning management systems. And they have won awards for that. Is it perfect? No, but it's pretty good. So that's something you don't have to worry too much about. Uh, obviously, there's very little you could do about that in any case. You're stuck with the learning management system you have. But it is something to consider when choosing learning management systems. Um, also, though, once, even if Canvas itself is accessible, the materials that you use within your Canvas course also need to be accessible. And that's not necessarily something Canvas can do anything about, or at least much about. Uh, it's up to us to ensure that the documents that we upload, the videos that we upload, the, all sorts of material that we upload for our students to use in Canvas are themselves accessible. Uh, there are, as I mentioned earlier, tools that you can use to help with that. Uh, the Canvas rich content editor we'll spend a lot of time looking at today. But given that so many documents that are created uh, for use in 
online education are created with Microsoft Office applications, especially here where the, the district basically provides it to uh, all faculty for free. Um, there is an accessibility checker built into Microsoft Office. Let me see if I can't pull up a Word document here. You can always find this under the review tab in the ribbon at the top of the screen. And it's right here over toward the left. And once you have your document completed, you can simply click on that and an accessibility panel will pop up over here on the left. And uh, immediate errors, <laughs> which I like to tell you I've deliberately left in this document, <laughs> um, are uh, identified. And if you click on the error, it will further identify exactly what's where the problem is. And it will give you some additional information and some steps on how to fix it. This is not the most sophisticated or the most thorough accessibility checker in the world, nor is the one built into Canvas. But it's not bad. And it will catch a lot of common errors and a lot of things that are fairly easy to fix. So it's worth running any of your Microsoft Word documents or Microsoft documents of any kind through this. And you'll, you may find a number of things that you can very easily do to make sure that these documents are as accessible as you can reasonably make. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with the Office Accessibility Checker since the one in Canvas is somewhat similar. And that's the one that you'll be using more often. So I'm gonna spend most of my time on that today, but I just wanted you to be aware of the existence of this checker and uh, know how to get to it. And, and this will be the same in any uh, Microsoft application, any Office application. Let me get that out of the way. Um, and, what I'm going to do for, from now on and for the bulk of the session is deal with uh, major web accessibility issues, major accessibility issues associated with content provided online via um, uh, uh, the World Wide Web. Oh, cool, Richard. Thank you. Nice to know that that's, that's one thing I can <laughs> say I've accomplished today. I appreciate that. Um, I didn't know it either. <laughs> oh, cool. All right. Today has not been a waste. <laughs> the, um, so I'm just going to take these issues one at a time here. Again, please jump in. If, uh, if you have questions or amplifications, the, the, we have two experts here today with us who are uh, sitting in to make sure I don't uh, mess up too badly and to <laughs> provide um, uh, some extra, I hope, uh, some extra information at times. But these are things that, these issues that are listed here are things that crop up again and again and again in uh, websites and web and learning management systems like Canvas that are pretty easy to fix, that are pretty easy to fix or avoid, and easy to understand. So let's, I'm going to go ahead and start those out. I'm going to do that by pulling this outline away now and going into Canvas itself. And much of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with Canvas Pages, which is you know, the, one of the two major content types in Canvas. You have pages and you have documents that you upload to Canvas. We just talked a little bit about how you can ensure those documents are uh, as accessible as possible. But uh, a lot of information in Canvas is provided via Canvas Pages, which are basically just web pages. If you brought a course over from Blackboard and you had a lot of content and what were called Blackboard items, which most of you did, um, 
those items became Canvas pages when they were brought over. And you're probably still using them the same way. And uh, there are lots of, and we're going to look at those various different accessibility issues through the lens of a Canvas page. In aid of that, I've put in this course, about the only thing in this course, some uh, samples of accessibility issues. And I'm going to bring up that page. And the first thing I'd like to talk about, a very simple idea, and something that you can just deal with by just being a little bit careful about how you type in links, hyperlinks into your course, uh, is link text. When you create a hyperlink in a web page or a Canvas page here, basically the same thing, um, you'll often have hyperlinks that link out to content outside of Canvas. For instance, I've got two links here. Oh, the City College, Professor Fauci. I'm sorry? Okay. I think Richard needs to just mute his microphone. There we go. <laughs> I control the horizontal, I control the vertical. Thank God for Zoom. Um, both of these are links to CNN that for a sighted person are basically equivalent. If I click on that link, I'll go to CNN and get depressed. So I'm gonna go right out of that again. And the same thing here. Both of those are hyperlinks to the CNN website. But they're quite different if you're not sighted. If you, have, if you are visually impaired and you're using a screen reader, a screen, one of the things a screen reader often does is uh, list links on a page uh, before or during your perusal of the page using the screen reader. And the word here is not going to mean anything at all because uh, that link may be se separated from the rest of the text. Here, however, for the anchor text for the link, I have just highlighted the uh, highlighted this text, and if that text is read out of context, it still means something. Obviously, the student, the uh, st student or the uh, user of Canvas would know that this link is going to access the CNN website. And if I edit this page. Don't you love the Canvas interface? And let me get these, uh, my video thumbnails out of the way there in case I'm covering something up on your screen. Um, when I highlight this, all I have to do to make a hyperlink here, of course, I should say, is to highlight this and go to the linked URL tool and there's the CNN URL. Um, this second option is far more accessible to someone using a screen reader. So very simple thing you can do, just think about it. When you create, when you create hyperlinks, make sure that the text to which the hyperlink is anchored means something and would more or less stand alone. And you can make a link as big as you need to. You can include as much text in the, as the anchor for the link as you need to. Um, so, simple thing that's very easy to accomplish. And this is something that not all accessibility checkers will catch either. So it's a, it's a nice thing to have in the back of your mind. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about deals with images, a classic uh, accessibility issue on the web is an image. It's, uh, if an image is properly selected, of course, to a sighted person, that image is, the purpose of that image is pretty obvious. In the case of the one you're seeing here, it's just a pretty picture. <laughs> but to a person with a screen reader, those images are, uh, to a blind person, of course, those images are not meaningful. 
unless we include what are called what's called alternate text or alt text. This is something that a screen reader will pick up and read to the um, to the blind person, describing the nature or the purpose of the image. It's real easy to put in. For instance, here uh, in this um, image here, if I uh, let's see, I'm in the editor. Yep. And if I go, uh, I can see what I the alt text on this looks like, if any, by going to the tool in the uh, Canvas rich content editor that says insert edit media. Click on that tool. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. The embed image tool, pardon me. Bad. I have to go back and edit that out. <laughs> um, and if we go to the canvas tab, probably the best way to go, it shows us the attributes of this particular image in canvas. And you'll see that there's a box for alt text. Every time you put an image in the canvas, this, the opportunity to add alt text is put right into your face. So you're not going to forget that option. Uh, by default, so that there's something in that uh, field, Canvas will put in the uh, file name of the uploaded image file. Unless that file name is very descriptive, it's not much use. So it's better, it might be better than nothing, but most accessibility checkers will flag this. If it's just a file name, they'll recognize it and say, that's not good enough. You need to put something here. Or in the case of this image, which is just a pretty picture, it doesn't convey any information. It's not something that the student really needs to worry about at all if they're not cited. You can just identify this image as decorative. That will cause a screen reader, and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> accessibility professional, um, a screen reader will just ignore this image and move right on, saving the blind student time. You're right, Dave. That, that is what it will do. Great. Will <laughs> and I think- I was very you... relieved when I saw you unmute yourself, Rochelle. <laughs> Well, and I think you also, it's just a good reminder that when you are including graphics just to include them, to kind of consider why you're including them sometimes, right. you know, <laughs> sometimes there's just a lot of additional content because of the, uh, how it will look to somebody who's cited, but for other people, maybe it's not necessary to include so many extra uh, decorative images. Because even to a person who's sighted, it may be distracting. Yes, right. Cool. Thank you yeah. very much. Um, so then I can just update that. And now that one will not impact screen reader at all. Uh, here I have a, a logo. Um, let me go to the embed image tool and see what I've got there. Well, I've just got that file name. That is totally useless. Uh, it's just going to confuse someone using a screen reader. So I need to provide something here. It doesn't need to be a lot, but it needs to be something. It might be like online learning. And if the screen reader is going to read it, it's really going to be helpful if I spell it right. Online learning pathways logo and update that. And now that when the screen reader comes to that, it will identify that as the logo. I could just make that decorative too, is it, uh, set that as a decorative image. There is some reason for having that image in the, uh, in the document certainly, but, uh, but at least now it's clear what that is to someone using a screen reader clear enough. So just a few words sometimes is enough. But what if we have an image like this? Let me save that and, and pull out so we can actually see the image. 
what about this? That's a good deal more challenging. Um, it's going to be relatively difficult to describe something like this to a blind person. I have made an effort. <laughs> Let's go back in and into the editor. Let me find my, now oh, there's my notepad. Let's go select that image, go to the embed tool. Okay. Jeez, takes long enough just to scroll over. It looks like I am. All right, this is a graph showing the, hold on, let me get this out of the way so we can see that graph again. This is a graph showing the upper right quadrant of a Cartesian coordinate system. The vertical Y axis represents distance traveled and is graduated which I misspelled, that's great, in kilometers in increments of 50 starting at zero and ending at 300. The horizontal or x-axis is graduating units of time, minutes, in increments of 30 minutes and runs from zero to 180. The graph pre presents as a straight line with a slope of one with data points ranging uh, from zero and zero to 180, 300, indicating a linear relationship between time and distance travel. <sighs> um, maybe a little overkill, but that's at least an indication of something that you might be able to do for someone. Uh, this image is still gonna be a challenge and it's difficult, particularly if someone's never been sighted and has never seen a Cartesian coordinate system. But it's an effort at, less, uh, at least. And Rochelle, thanks so much for posting in the chat tool there. Uh, there is extensive information and advice on writing uh, alt tags at this link here. So just a few, that was just a few quick illustrations of that. And again, with Canvas, let me go down to the bottom here for a second. In Canvas, when you go to enter a uh, an image, embed an image in a Canvas page, and go to Canvas, you will always be presented with the option to insert alt text or designate an image as decorative. So there's not a lot of effort involved as long as you take the time to do it. All right, visual contrast. Some people who can see cannot see well and they have uh, visual impairments short of, um, of actual blindness. Indeed, this is far more common than actual blindness. It's important, one thing that's important for these people is that uh, the elements in your Canvas pages be clearly visible with as high a level of contrast as possible. And indeed, most web browsers have a high contrast mode or even web pages can have a high contrast mode that users can switch on that enhances contrast and makes it that much easier to view but all of your users will benefit from a reasonable level of uh, contrast. And case in point here being, is there a limit to how long the alt text can be? I have not yet found it, Richard. <laughs> Sorry, that's pretty long. Certainly anything longer than that, would be a great challenge <laughs> to the person trying to use the page. So the briefest alt text that is, can uh, possibly be um, applied and still accomplish the goal is desirable. 
Good question. Thank you. Uh, but this text right here is difficult for me to read on my screen. I imagine it is for you too, unless I highlight it. So what can we do about that? Well, obviously we can choose our text color and background wisely. Um, I'll use this to illustrate to the, for the first time, the accessibility checker that is available in the rich content editor in, uh, uh, in Canvas. You'll find it on the second row of icons here at the far right. And uh, Galileo's little graphic of the, uh, the scope of humans there. If we click on that, an accessibility checker uh, page. Okay, well, it didn't like my, <laughs> first off, it did not especially like my uh, alt text. It's too long. I couldn't figure out a way to describe that graph in shorter, so I might ignore that, but uh, it, at least it is going to notify me of that. Dave, can Next. I add something? Yes. Please. So something that you might want to consider, which um, there is the option for just adding that additional text under the image. So that the screen reader then would read it just as text versus reading it as a tag. Gotcha. And I think you'll see that if you look at any kind of a certain like textbooks and things like that underneath, they will usually have a description of, of whatever that picture is. So sometimes that, that then the screen reader doesn't have to read through all of that content it can just give some information saying this is an image describing that whatever you said it was x y or a b or whatever and then right. the actual text that is included under the image has all of that content right as a caption then rather than as uh yes an alt text yeah yeah so great thank you um but here's the next issue here um this is uh, the minimum contrast ratio it should be 4.5 to 1 and this is apparently way below that so uh the accessibility checker right here gives us a way to um uh, deal with this text very quickly by just changing the text color to something a little bit more a little bit darker and now this text is no longer hard to read So I'm going to bomb out of that for a second here, or for the moment. We'll come back to it later. So you want reasonable contrast. And uh, the uh, accessibility checker in both Microsoft Office and in, the, in, in Canvas will catch that. And, so, and usually it's not this dramatic an issue. You may have put something in there that I thought looked good, but it's just a little bit too low in contrast. And this will warn you and encourage you to change it until the contrast is a little bit more or a little bit less likely to cause problems of that nature. All righty. Let's see, where am I? Information delivered only via color. Um, it's a very bad idea in any content that you put on the web to uh, put information in whose only source is color because there are numerous, numerous forms of color blindness that affect large numbers of people around the world. Red green color blindness is the most common uh, sex linked recessive trait, but um, the, um, uh, there are many other types of color blindness. And everybody perceives color a little bit differently. So provide, uh, and, uh, we do have a tendency to provide information in the form of color. How many times have you seen a box light up on a website when you didn't fill it in, in a form on a, on a website? And you fill in, the, and for some reason the form doesn't submit, and you come back and you see a box that's outlined in red 
Well, that's great if you're not red, green, colorblind. But if you are, you're never, it's going to be very difficult for you to find the bad bot. So you want to find some other way to convey the same information. I've got a little example here that I jumped uh, up in a, a bad Excel sheet. Let me bring that over. Here I've got a just a, a mocked up bar chart. And I've got two series of data. I'm showing uh, arbitrarily labeled expenses and profit. And they're indicated in the legend with different colors. Not a good idea to have that be the only thing. Uh, how do I avoid that? Well, in Excel, I can select the one of the series. And I can go to chart style. Uh, nope, sorry. I can right click once I select that again, I can right click on the chart and I can format data series. And I can go to the fill and line section there. And instead of automatic, which is to you do it by color, I can go to pattern fill. And I can select different patterns. I can do that for both series. So that it's much easier for someone who's colorblind to do that. And you can go in and you can change the color as well. But you can combine these two types of um, attributes for this graph and ensure that someone who is colorblind can appreciate the variation between the different uh, 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 data series here in that graph. That's just one, uh, one example of many sorts of things that um, you can do to avoid that uh, trap of using color solely to provide information. Very good. All right, let me find my... Too many things open here. Find my outline again. There we go. <laughs> um, now let's talk about a little bit about tables. Tables in web pages can be problematic from an accessibility point of view. They can be problematic enough that maybe the easiest way to avoid such problems is to avoid tables unless they're absolutely necessary. Uh, I could probably find some other way to uh, present this information here that did not involve tables that would not bedevil screen readers nearly as much. But there are times when you just do need tables on a web page. So what can you do to ensure that the table is reasonably comprehensible to someone using a screen reader? Well, let's let the, uh, let's let the accessibility checker inform us on that. Excuse me. Oops. What I meant to do. All right, let's. We've already talked about that. We've already talked about that. I must not have updated that. Okay, here we do. Here we go with the table. The first thing you can do with a table is to add a caption informing the person using the screen reader what the table contains what kind of information is there. That will make it a lot more comprehensible when the screen reader starts working through it. So this is a, uh, this is the Canvas Training Seminar Schedule Spring 2020. I can apply that. And that's one thing we can do with the table. Another thing we can do is identify headers if the table has them either across the top or down the side. And this table does have a header row. It doesn't have a header column, but it has a header row. I need to tell the screen reader that and apply that. 
Okay, there are other issues with tables that I that we just don't have time to address right here right now, and that I'm probably not qualified to address anyway. Um, if any of you have any good links about that, I'd love to have. Uh, but I'm just going to move on right now, and just again to say that uh, if you don't need a table, don't use it. Is the easiest way to avoid these issues. And let me stop there for a second, about halfway through, I'd say, or a little more, and uh, ask if anybody has any outstanding questions that they, they've been thinking about asking but haven't jumped in with yet. Yes, I have a big question. Please. <laughs> I don't expect an answer immediately. But, uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as teaching like art history or humanities with a lot of art images, it sounds yes. to me like it's really problematic. <laughs> That's a challenge. That's a challenge. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Uh, how that challenge is addressed, of course, is going to be pretty much up to you. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly you can put basic descriptions on uh, right. visual art images and things like that but and Dave I added a link for um, some of the techniques for creating accessible tables oh good good thank you thank you um, so the uh, uh, Obviously, there are realistic limits to which you can go, and accessibility is a process that we never quite get to the end of. And there are some things that are almost inherently in, inaccessible to certain people, but we can do our very best. And um, where the you know we're we're tasked with making a reasonable effort where the borderline between reasonable and unreasonable is is not a hard and fast line and for that sort of discussion i would refer you to people like rochelle and taylor here mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. accessibility specialists at uh, at your college to help you decide where that line is yeah okay yeah, thank you. I just um, wish I had a good answer for you. Yeah, no, I've been asked to see <laughs> humanities online, and I, I just think it's pretty, would be very difficult. Think of the Renaissance and trying to explain the significance of the different painters. Anyway, you see the issue. But I will guarantee you that efforts that you make in that direction will make those images much more valuable to the students who can see them. Mm hmm yeah so and i'm just going to stop right there <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah i know yeah. it's a it's a big uh, big challenge <laughs> yeah. thank you you bet thank you for the question anybody else um oh richard <laughs> what is that background image in my video um that's a, a technique you can use in Zoom if you have a, uh, a featureless wall behind you that's more or less monochromatic, single color. Um, in my case, I've got a green screen behind me. Mm -hmm. And, and it, if you have something it, like I, that, it, you can it, put a background image in. And that background, the background image in question is a picture taken out my back window from uh, uh, on a day more or less like today in uh, Northern Idaho, a little bit cloudy. Uh, most of the snow has melted off, amazingly enough. We don't, we're not foolish enough to think that <laughs> we were done with snow for the uh, winter, but that's where that image came from, Richard. And you, if you look at uh, Rochelle's video there, Rochelle, you want to say something? So you pop sure, up I was going to say that you don't necessarily have to, if you have a newer operating system, 
um, and the latest version of Zoom. You don't need a green screen. You can just no, you, um, you can just find an image that you like, and um, on your option of the toolbar at the bottom, where it has the little up little up carrot where it says select a camera and then it has choose virtual background you can select a virtual background that of a picture that you may like and um, then you can just um, include that as part of your background which sometimes I'll turn that on uh, if I have students and things and I'm doing a presentation and then that way if any students are walking behind me they don't show up you, all you see is my sheep. <laughs> <laughs> a very good point. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it works better if the background behind you is at least fairly simple. But you can try it, and it may wear the, uh, the newest Zoom clients, which we're using here, are surprisingly good, even if you don't have a feature with small. So you can always try it. There you go, Richard. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, and something just to note, and this is not necessarily accessibility stuff, but it does have some drag time. So as you can see, if I move my arm kind of quickly, my arm disappears, you know, for a second. So. But if you have a green screen. If you have a green screen, it doesn't. It doesn't so much, right? <laughs> right. But that's one of the limitations. So if you're doing a recording, you know, just don't move around a lot. You could, if you sit still, if you're recording, it will keep your background. But if you move around a lot, you will see that drag or whatever they call that, the dissipation. Indeed. Yeah. And that, that's true to a certain extent, even if you do have a green screen. By the way, for as little as $20 on Amazon, you can get a green drape, just a piece of green cloth that you can hang over a door or a coat rack or something behind you and improve your uh, green screen or your chroma key or virtual background performance in Zoom. Uh, it's also possible if you want to get uh, extremely video geeky and spend a, ins not an insignificant amount of money, you can put an actual video behind you. Um, to do that, I have to run a, uh, video cable across my living room floor, for which my wife has limited patience, particularly since we had a Super Bowl party last night <laughs> at our home theater. But um, it can be done. It's, it's kind of fun to do. Very good. Love little digressions like that. Sometimes they're the most interesting part of the presentation. So please feel free to ask any questions like that. Now, uh, we're getting down to the point here of one of the more bedeviling sorts of accessibility issues in uh, any kind of web delivered content, including Canvas pages or any anything in Canvas, and that's media accessibility. By media, I'm primarily talking here about audio recordings and videos. These pre uh, present special accessibility challenge uh, challenges, obviously, to, uh, to anyone with certain sensory issues, whether they're blind, deaf, or simply hard of hearing, or have visual impairments. Uh, these types of content provide special challenges. There are things you can do, of course, to minimize those challenges for folks. You can't eliminate them, but you can minimize them. Uh, let's start uh, with the what might seem to be the simpler issue, which is audio accessibility. All you need to make an audio uh, presentation uh, or an audio file accessible to folks who can't hear it is to provide a transcript. Of course, if, you, if the audio is lengthy, uh, providing a transcript can be a bit of a challenge. And there are not a lot of great solutions to that, unfortunately. There are speech-to-text engines or tools of all sorts that can produce uh, a transcript from 
an audio uh, playback of an audio file, but they don't tend to work as well as they do when you're actually speaking live to it. Like uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking is a classic uh, speech to text tool. It's also a speech recognition tool. The two things are different. Speech recognition allows you to speak to a piece of software and issue it commands, and it recognizes those commands and executes them. Whereas speech to text allows you to speak, to read, or, or to, to speak at a, a piece of software and have it convert that to text, which can then be saved and provided in a variety of ways to people. And Dragon does both. But it does a lot better if you speak directly to it through a microphone than it does if you play an audio file to it, especially if it has not been trained to recognize that voice. Um, the technology is getting better all the time. It requires less training, but it's still a bit of a challenge. It works a lot better if, uh, if the source of the audio is your voice because you can get a tool like Dragon Naturally Speaking and you can train it by reading to it, reading known text to it in your voice. And then uh, Dragon will do quite a good job of converting your speech to text. There are also tools built into uh, Chrome, the web browser. There's a speech to text recognition tool that is integrated in certain places in Canvas that you can use. That's, um, uh, I don't have Dragon here today to demonstrate to you, so I'm just going to have to talk to you about that. But I can show you the uh, Canvas speech to text tool or the in a, the chrome speech to text tool that is integrated into canvas you will find it if you go let me go to uh, bidi, bidi, bidi. to a course where i have something that i can use to illustrate it and the most notable uh, location of that is in the grading tool, the speed grader. Uh, let me find here a submission that has Actually, forgive me for a second. There's a better, come to think of it, there's a better place to do this. Uh, course that I used just last week. I'm grading. There we go. This submission involved a Word document. That's where this works best. I go to the speed grader. I've already provided some uh, feedback here, but if I want to provide some more, I can use this little tool down here at the lower part of the speed grader, uh, speed grader's right hand panel. If I click that, This was an adequate submission. Uh, please view the other content here or feedback here, which will give you information on how to improve it, period. Stop. As you can see, these tools can be quite accurate. And if I submit that, that will become a part of the grading record for that uh, course. 
And you can use this Chrome uh, dictation tool in other instances as well. But it's not, as far as I know, it's not particularly useful if you are, um, if you have an audio file that you've already recorded. I don't think you can use this tool to create a transcript from it automatically. So that you may end up simply having to type that out. But there is another um, sort of a, a workaround for this that I'm going to show you after I talk about the next section of the uh, uh, presentation here, which is video accessibility. There are, I do know a trick there, which I have used, which may help you. And some of you may know of some other things that I don't that are readily available and easy to use in that regard. But the in the final analysis, if you are going to use audio in your Canvas course, you also need to provide a link to a transcript of that audio so that the um, so that uh, hearing impaired students can benefit from the information in that audio file. If you simply provide that information in another format, that's fine too. Because, and you might ask, why would you bother to do something like that to make an audio uh, presentation of something and then also put it in in text in the, into a Canvas page or whatever? And the answer to that being that some people process uh, information audibly better than they do visually. Or having both vastly improves their understanding of the material. So it's worthwhile doing that in many cases. So now let's deal with the really thorny issue, that of video accessibility. <clears throat> video is inherently problematic. The video, uh, so here I'm talking about video with an audio track, a soundtrack as well combined and synchronized audio and video. Video is inherently problematic for people with sensory difficulties, whether they have hearing issues or um, are blind or hear, uh, uh, visually impaired. If uh, a blind student can't hear the soundtrack and much of the information in a video with uh, both video and sound is going to come in through the soundtrack. Someone who's blind can hear the soundtrack, but they can't see the video. <coughs> and yet we are tasked to ensure that students who, um, that all students who use our online courses can benefit from the content that we put in them. Vis-a-vis video accessibility, I'm going to deal with the easier of the two issues first. And that is the issue of uh, making the soundtrack accessible to folks who are hearing impaired. That, of course, involves captioning. This is an issue we've been dealing with for decades now. And the means of dealing with it and tools for dealing with it are quite well established. They've gotten very good and are reasonably easy to use and not imp no longer impossibly time consuming. Uh, so this is a relatively easy problem to solve. In order to uh, get a feeling for this, let's go to YouTube. If you're putting video up, for an online course, I will tell you that, and this is something, this is, this is one of my things. I don't know much about accessibility, but I, and I'm no video professional either, but I know a lot more about video in online learning than I know about most things. You can take that for what it's worth. And this is an issue I've been dealing with for a long time. And I'm going to tell you, if you're going to put video into your online course, the way to 
that I would recommend doing it is to put that video on YouTube. It's free. It's available. Anyone can watch it. It is uh, available. It will play on almost any device that a student might use to access your course from a smartphone to a computer to an iPad, whatever. YouTube will work on it. Even the first iPhone worked on YouTube. And it will display, and these days, of course, the YouTube apps will display the captions if they're available. So it's a great way to provide video to your students. <coughs> it doesn't use up any of the limited disk space you have associated with your Canvas course. You can eat that up if you're uploading video to Canvas in a hurry. And Canvas is not really designed as a video server. So um, the performance of the video playback may suffer from time to time. But the number one reason really to me for putting your video on YouTube is accessibility. Uh, oh, good question. I see it came in relative to video. Will students see commercials on YouTube videos? Some, yes, it's almost impossible to completely avoid them. But if you embed your videos into a Canvas page, the extraneous advertisement will be much less obtrusive. Mainly what you have to worry about are the suggested videos that pop up at the end and somehow manage to link somebody in a uh, conceptually link somebody in a thong to whatever uh, concept you were just presenting. Uh, you can, if you're a, a reasonably confident YouTube or a, a, a experienced YouTube user, there are ways to turn that off too. So you can almost get um, um, rid of the vast majority of extraneous content, advertising content, that YouTube wants to display by embedding these things into, um, uh, into your Canvas pages. So that eliminates, and thank you very much for asking that question because that always comes up when I start talking about using YouTube. That really uh, eliminates a lot of the objections to using YouTube. And probably, if you mess up and your students do see somebody in a thong, it probably won't scar them for life. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what they would see me in a thong, that would probably be something they'd never be able to unsee. But uh, hopefully that's not up on YouTube. Okay, so uh, accessibility for YouTube videos obviously involves captioning. And let me emphasize right off the bat here that a transcript, simply providing a transcript with a video is not adequate to, uh, to meet the requirements of Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which we are tasked to meet by board policy and other things. Uh, a transcript is pretty much useless with a video because it's not, there's no way to synchronize it with a video. I have seen little um, uh, transcript tools that will allow you to provide a transcript, a little bouncing ball that moves along. Okay, here's a dangerous question. Who here remembers Mitch Miller? <laughs> Sing along with Mitch, aha, somebody just betrayed themselves. Uh, <laughs> an ancient program from the early days of television where the, little, the lyrics would appear on the screen and the little ball would bounce along and you could sing along with Mitch. Uh, well, you can get that. There are tools that will do that now here. Oh, Rochelle, you really didn't have to admit that. But uh, <laughs> obviously I remember it. The, you can get that sort of sing along with Mitch uh, illustration or uh, presentation but that takes your eyes off the video. You have to watch it constantly. You almost can't 
look at the video at all. With captions, once you're used to using it, once you use captions a few times, they, they really don't obtrude that much on watching the video because they're in the video. And you're looking right at the video while you're looking at the captions. But if you have a separate transcript in another, even if it's just below the video, and the little thing bouncing along, it just totally destroys your ability to concentrate on the video. So transcripts are just not adequate. You need captions which are synchronized with the video that only pop the text up when the video is, when the uh, sound that's associated with that text is playing. So how do we do that? Well, the good news on YouTube is, as far as YouTube goes, is we just put the video on YouTube. About, what is it, seven, eight years ago now, I guess, YouTube added an automatic caption captioning function to uh, the site so that any video that went up there would eventually at least be captioned by automatic speech recognition. In the early days, the speech, speech recognition was uh, hilariously inaccurate. Uh, it was a favorite uh, pastime to put soundtracks up there that would uh, produce hilariously uh, inaccurate uh, captions or <laughs> obscene ones, things like that. It, uh, it was really inadequate. Over the last several years, it has evolved though. And the speech recognition engine that YouTube uses, and it, by pulling this, automatically pulling the soundtrack of your video out and converting that sound, that um, uh, your words to text and then synchronizing, displaying them synchronously with the video is now amazingly accurate. Assuming the soundtrack is of reasonable quality and that you speak as distinctly as you possibly can, but those are things, of course, that are important anyway, because if a student can't understand, uh, if a hearing student can't easily understand your, uh, your narration of your video, they're not gonna watch it anyway, or they're not gonna get much out of it. People will put up with bad video, but they won't put up with bad audio. They'll just tune out. They won't watch it or they'll you know, just swan off and zone out. So as long as you have reasonably decent video, YouTube will do a good job. Case in point, here's a short video I made for my, for a session uh, uh, last week. And let's, let me think here. Did I, when I shared this, did I select? No, I did not. Uh, pardon me just a second, I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna restart it. And I'm gonna select these, uh, an option in the bottom of the, at the bottom of the share window that I'm seeing and you're not, um, that says share computer sound and optimize for full screen video clip. I'm gonna click both of those options. That slows down the share performance a little bit, but it's gonna make it uh, much more effective for me to share this YouTube video with you on Zoom which is a pretty darn remarkable thing to be able to do on Zoom for something that you're not having to pay for at all. And if you had to pay for it, it would be, and you paid for it by the year, it would be about $13 a month. Okay, hit play. Oh, and unmute, <laughs> sorry, that was not helpful. Starting a Zoom Starting meeting. A Zoom meeting. Uh, there are a number of ways to turn on this caption. Uh, let's focus on one. Let's go to the Zoom homepage on, in any web browser. That's the URL is zoom.us. Just press enter, type that in and press enter, and you'll go to the Zoom homepage. 
If you're not already signed into your Zoom account, you can sign in right here. Uh, you'll provide your the email address that you use for your login ID. Okay, not perfect, but darn near. Almost all the text is there. The errors in the text were due to errors in my speech, <laughs> not <laughs> due to YouTube's recognition of it. It is somewhat humbling to look at captions created from your audio narration. Um, but particularly the number of times the word uh appears, but uh, the accuracy is amazing these days. Again, if the sound quality is reasonably good and it will accurately transcribe a wide variety of voices and accents. They've been <coughs> working on this for years. So if you put your video up on YouTube, it will have captions and competently executed captions, competently ex displayed captions with two lines and the scrolling captions and so on, which are much easier for a person who needs the captions to, uh, to use. It is not, however, perfect. Notably, you don't have punctu uh, caps and punctuations, a sentence um, uh, structure and so on, or sentence discrimination. The question then becomes, is this adequate? Uh, And that's not a question I, I think I can answer for you. Certainly it would be better if this were uh, edited and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. It's not difficult. It's merely time consuming. Uh, is it adequate for someone who doesn't know or who can't hear it to actually follow what's going on in the video? The best I can say is that's debatable. Uh, a lot of the video, and I will tell you a lot of the video that I have in my uh, 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 courses or in my presentations and so on is just using the, uh, the automatic captions. Notably, this presentation is being recorded right now and I will put it up on YouTube and YouTube will caption it, and I will not spend the uh, roughly three to four hours it would take to go through and clean up the sentence uh, discrimination and so on issues. If I, if there's something totally uh, like a technical term that didn't uh, get recognized at all or something, I'll, I'll try to go through and catch that. But I'm, I'm not going to spend hour after hour after hour doing that. Maybe I should, but I just don't have the time or the patience. Even retired, I don't have the time or the patience to do that. Uh, that would make lecture capture, basically what we're doing here, totally impossible to, or at least impossible to make it reasonably perfectly verbatim accurate in terms of captions. Uh, YouTube does a phenomenal job. I'm just going to leave it at that point. Can you edit the closed caption test text? Thank you again, Richard. Yes, you can. If it's your video, you can't edit someone else's captioned text. So if you're using someone else's, uh, YouTube video, you are, while there are ways, there are tricks you can use to edit captions on a video that's not owned by you. The doing so is suspect in terms of copyright law. 
and the process is exceptionally tedious. So it rarely gets done. But still, the video will almost certainly be pretty well captioned. And if it's not, of course, you can just not use it. You can find, <laughs> probably find another video on YouTube that covers the same subject matter that is reasonably well captioned. So I'm not, particularly since I'm recording this, I'm not going to make any categorical statements of whether exactly whether I would edit the captions in certain circumstances and so on, but I'm certainly going to show you how to do it. Again, though, this has to be your video in order to make this work. Okay, I'm in YouTube and I am logged in as me because I can see my little picture up here. If I'm not logged in as me, I have to log into my Google account which get automatically gives me a YouTube account. Uh, one Google account covers all of Google stuff from Google Drive to YouTube to Gmail to everything. So to get to this video, to edit it, there's a couple of things I could do. I could go to my um, uh, video channel and I could find it there and edit it from there, but probably the easiest way to get to editing the captions on a video is just bring it up in YouTube, be signed in as yourself, and that will provide you with this edit video button here, just below the video. You just click that, and it'll take you into the new video uh, details page for YouTube. And you get a basic page and a more options page. You'll need the more options page. And you can go to uh, subtitles and close captions here. Click on the menu and you can edit in the classic video studio, which is much more powerful actually in many ways. YouTube has recently redone this video management, their video management uh, tools to accommodate a ruling. I'm not sure whether it's an EU ruling or whether it's worldwide that any video that is, in, is intended for kids has to be so designated and uh, meet certain requirements. So at the very least, you have to say, no, this video is not in intended for minors other than college students or whatever. And you can't do that in the classic uh, video management tools in YouTube. So you have to hop back and forth between them. It's a bit of a pain, but as you can see, the process of getting to this was fairly straightforward. Um, I can then just click this edit button. And here are my automatic captions in an editable format. And in many cases, you can edit these by just, by just reading and saying, well, you know, that seems pretty reasonable. I think that's what I said. And you can just make your edits. That was, sound, that looks like the end of a sentence. I'll put a period there, put a cap there and move on. If it's not obvious just by reading it, you can also, of course, play the video. Starting a Zoom meeting. Uh, there are a number of ways to do this, but uh, let's focus on one. Let's go to the Zoom homepage on, in any web browser. That's the URL. Oops. <laughs> Couldn't make up my mind on the preposition there. This is quite humbling. So I can change that to in. That's really the better preposition there, I think. That's the one I <laughs> decided to use the second time. So I can just play this and pause it and edit and play and pause it and edit. So I'm gonna go all the way through. Really a pretty simple process, but not a quick one. I'll publish those edits to make them a part of the video.
Now, if I play, starting a Zoom meeting at, after turning on captions, starting a Zoom meeting. Uh, there are a number of ways to do this, but uh, let's focus on one. Let's go to the, so we saw those couple of edits I did there. So that's all there is to editing the captions and YouTube videos. It's simple to do, as you can see. It is uh, pretty time consuming, but not impossible by any means. And that's about uh, a uh, the best, about all I can really say about that. <laughs> and uh, Richard, good, good. Uh, Richard, did that uh, answer your questions about the uh, fully provide you the information you needed to get in and edit your YouTube captions? Excellent, excellent. Very good. All right. The uh, well, that's pretty much what I have to say about video accessibility. If you do this and embed this video in uh, your Canvas uh, page, uh, in a Canvas page, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. Let's go back to Canvas and see that. Let me go back to our uh, course that we were in earlier, our sandbox course for accessibility. There we go. Except I think I missed it. Oh, great. It moved it on me while I was clicking on it. Thanks, Canvas. Okay. And go to our pages and that sample page we were playing with. And let's embed a video here. Let's see how easy that is to do accessibly, except of course I have to edit this page. I always forget that. Go down to the bottom. In, uh, in, any inserts you do of course occur at the position of the blinking cursor in the, um, uh, in the editor. And there are actually more than one way to put a YouTube video in here. You can search for the video in YouTube using this little tool in the uh, second line of the uh, icon bar on the editor. But usually the easiest, most effective way is to use the insert edit media tool here. Go to the embed tab and paste in what's called the embed code for your YouTube video. You can get that from your YouTube video, obviously by bringing up your video on YouTube. Easiest way to do that is probably to click on the title of the video there. And there's the main the playback Zoom page home page. Video. Thought I turned off autoplay, shoot. Uh, <laughs> that's irritating, you have it start before you need it. Then go to the share button, which you'll see, whether it's your video or not, you'll see the share button. And you see the basic link for the video, and you can't just link the video in, but it's a lot cooler and a lot more effective, particularly in terms of avoiding advertisements if you embed the video in your YouTube or in your uh, Canvas page. So I'll click that option, and here's your so called embed code. Uh, if you're not a, an HTML guru, you don't have to worry about what that looks like. All you have to do is click the copy button down here in the lower right that copies that embed code to your clipboard. Close this, go back to uh, Canvas, again go to the embed tab and paste with a control V from the keyboard that video in, or that embed code in and click OK. Now you immediately get a, an embedded YouTube video. The student can 
play this video right from here. Starting a Zoom meeting. They can turn the, uh, there are a number of ways to do this, but uh, let's focus on one. They can uh, expand it to full page so it's easier to see. Or they can just press escape to get back out of that. Oops. They do, if they do that, get this more videos thing popping up, but you can turn that off in YouTube. Um, and they can play it to the end one and basically avoid. Let's go to the Zoom the advertising page. in YouTube on, in any web browser. So embedding a video on a page, a YouTube video on a page, eliminates a lot of the objections to using YouTube. Just going back to that question we had earlier. And the accessibility is excellent. And if the student wants to go to YouTube and wants to see other suggestions and things like that, they can also just click here and they'll take them to the video on YouTube. So you get the best of both worlds, basically. All right. Um, we've already seen, basically, let's see what the, um, uh, something else I wanted to mention there. What was it? Uh, it'll come to me. Let's see what the accessibility checker makes of this rather eclectic web page here now. Uh, we've already dealt with this, so I'm just going to next pass that. We've dealt with the uh, uh, accessibility issues. I didn't apply that before, so I should. Huh. It's pretty happy with it. So just another look quickly at the accessibility checker here in Canvas. Note that that does only work on Canvas pages that are in the editor, that you're editing, that you're working on. If you want to edit those, if you want to check the accessibility of the Word doc, of your Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, uh, PowerPoint presentations, you know, again, you'll use that accessibility checker that's found in the Office application and under the uh, Review tab in the thread, in the uh, ribbon, excuse me, at the top of the page. But there is one more thing I want to show you here. We're, we're making very good time today. Um, the, there is something else you can do with this page, with any Canvas page, once it's saved. And this is something that's new in the last month or so in Canvas. And it's called the Microsoft Immersive Reader. You will see it any time a page pops up on the screen. You and the students will see it up here as an option just to the right of the edit button. And it is an amazingly cool thing. So we'll spend the rest of our time today, uh, outside of answering questions, if you have any, on the immersive re the Microsoft Immersive Reader. The Microsoft Immersive Reader is available both in Office applications and in the in canvas pages within canvas it only works with pages so it's another uh, uh, incentive to provide content in canvas to your students via canvas pages you can't use this within canvas as far as i know if you upload a word, like you upload your syllabus as a Word document to Canvas, you can't use the Immersive Reader with it. You have to convert that Canvas, that Word document, and move that content into a Canvas page. Um, we'll see if somebody's interested. Uh, we can talk about how you might do that, though. Just very briefly, you can. Canvas is much less picky about uh, copying and pasting content directly from Word right into the Canvas-rich content editor. It usually doesn't blow up. It may not 
work very well, but it probably won't blow up the document. Or you, in Word, say you have something in a Word document, you can save the Word document as a filtered web page and then copy and paste from that in the Canvas a couple of different ways and get <coughs> pretty much a reasonable transfer of content from a Word document to a Canvas page. And that's sort of another another part of another session, but I'll just mention that at this point. So it's not that limiting to have this only available in Canvas pages. Let's uh, go to, uh, this Canvas page is not going to be an especially good uh, illustration of the immersive reader's capabilities. So let's go back to another course here. Uh, let's see, that's one that's probably got more content in it than most. Now, if I uh, notice that this page does not have that immersive reader display because it's the home section here. But if I go into pages and access a page, now the immersive reader is available. A minor quirk. If students access a page from within a module, they will see the immersive reader option. Let's just see what that, what that brings up for us here. Okay, it's a much simplified version of the page. It uh, shortens the lines in many cases. It increases the size of the text. So if someone is visually challenged, they're much more likely to be able to read this than that. The alt tags, are listed in lieu of the images themselves so that the student can concentrate on the text and not be distracted by the images. Though so any alt tag that you put up here will display. So someone, uh, I'm told that someone who is dyslexic, for instance, finds it, finds it much easier to read in a situation like this than, like, than in the uh, standard representation of the page. And there are all sorts of other cognitive issues that can be minimized with this. Also, obviously, somebody who's visually challenged can see this better. It's high contrast, black on white, and everything's blown up. And you can govern text size. You can increase text size here. And you can increase spacing between the text. That's set here. I must have set that by default. You can change the font. Yeah, everybody thinks co uh, Comic Sans is useless and so on. But in fact, this font was developed to help young children learn to read. That was its original purpose. So anyone who's having trouble reading may find Comic Sans easier to read. I didn't know that. I had to. <laughs> so I got that in another in a presentation I watched. So you can make adjustments here. You also have grammar options. You can have it uh, note syllables. That can help. Uh, people with reading difficulties. You can have it identify certain parts of speech. Notice that it does that, uh, verbs in this case, it does that by color. But you can all, but, and we just talked about not providing information solely on the basis of color, but you have an option to show labels as well. So the B for verb can show up. Pretty cool. The coolest thing, of course, is this. Course homepage, online learning pathways logo. Welcome to introduction to screencasting. It will read it to you in a very clear, easy to understand voice. So it is something of a screen reader in and of itself. And it's free and it's embedded in Canvas and you can use it without any 
uh, uh, fee or difficulty. Pretty cool. I think the coolest thing I have yet seen, though, I can illustrate with a different page. I need to go back to our, our original thing here. <clears throat> Let me pull up a different page. No, I don't want Chrome to do the translation here. Well, for starters, if I go into the immersive reader with this, taking a Spanish class, want to hear what this sounds like? Spanish document. Para su conveniencia, hemos traducido diferentes documentos al español para nuestros padres de familia, estudiantes y miembros de la comunidad. Uh, that just blew me away the first time I saw it. And this blows me away even more. If I go to reading preferences, I can tell it to translate the entire document in the United States English. Let me take out the syllables and the You're wondering if that, I was wondering if that Spanish translation was any good. Well, if this is any indication, it's pretty darn good. There it is. So your students for whom English is not their first language can easily uh, get pretty decent translations of your documents that you put into Canvas pages, or your Canvas pages, uh, just with a, a couple of mouse clicks. And the selection of languages is truly remarkable. Uh, Anyone know the uh, the text of Clark's first law of technology, referring to Arthur Clark? It reads, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And this is about as good an illustration of that. This surely follows Clark's law. So that's uh, about the coolest thing I have seen in a, an online and certainly in accessibility and maybe an online education period uh, for quite some time. And that is available to you <laughs> at any time to, uh, and, and any Canvas page. Okie dokie. Um, there, and this, that was just a quick overview of it. There, if you want more information about it, you can go to the Microsoft page on the Immersive Reader, and there is a wonderful 15 minute illustration of all this, which is what I looked at before I decided to do this uh, session. Uh, let me put that, uh, that URL in the chat tool, so you'll have that. If you want to keep these URLs, let's see, I think, I don't know whether you can see my chat tool or not when I drag it over here. I can't remember whether that send, whether uh, Zoom sends that or not. But if you look at the bottom right-hand corner of the chat tool, you'll see a little menu uh, icon, the three uh, dots in a row, an ellipsis. If you, if you mouse over it, you get a tool tip that says more. If you click that, there's an option to save the chat tool, or save the chat log, I'm sorry. 
and that will save our chat session for the day. So you'll have all of this information in there. You don't have to, if there's something quick you need and you knew it was in the chat tool, you don't have to listen through the recording to find it or scroll through the recording to find it. You can pull it right out of the chat tool. All right. That is everything I have for you today. And I finished eight minutes early. I'm not quite sure how that happened. I've almost never do that. So let me ask you if you have any further questions on this or anything else that I, you think I might have some prayer of answering. Well, thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. I'm like I say, I'm learning everything as I go here. <laughs> cool. Well, I hope you found this of some use. Yes. And there will be a the recording will be available. It will be captioned and it'll be available shortly. And also let me put my email address in here. I'm going to encourage you all to contact me anytime you have a question about anything involving instructional technology, online education, or whatever. Uh, I am contracted with the district to help out in this way for at least at least till the end of June. And I love to hear, especially love to hear from folks who have been in one of these sessions. So uh, though it's great to hear from anybody. So please don't ever hesitate to uh, ask me a question. And if it's something that's too complex to deal with in an email or a short screencast video that I can send you, I'll be happy to meet with you one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom, just like this. I'm happy to do that at any time. All you have to do is email me and uh, request it and have us set up a mutually convenient time. I have somebody scheduled for tomorrow afternoon already from another session. So uh, that's uh, something I love to do. And the district will pay me for it. So <laughs> please take advantage of it. Uh, and um, I'll look forward to hearing from you. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple of questions in the chat tool here. Um, is the Immersive Reader new for this semester? I don't, yes, it is. It's, it's only been available in Canvas for about a month and a half, I think. I just found it. Uh, actually, I was doing one of these an overview session uh, on Canvas earlier in the semester or in the intersection. And one of the people attending asked me about it. I'd never heard of it, so I had to go look it up. And then we got it, uh, we got it turned on, and we had to go to our Canvas support and get it turned on in our system and so on. But it's, it's only been available for a month or two. So it is new. And where am I located? I am located in northern Idaho in a little town called Hope. Not named, I might add, not named. Uh, uh, about the aspiration or name for the aspiration, but for the name, last name of the veterinarian who used to, uh, in the 19th century, care for the an animals uh, used by the railroad. Hope was originally a railroad camp. But that, uh, that image you're seeing behind me, if I stop share, is uh, Lake Ponderé in the in northern Idaho. It is the uh, one of the largest freshwater lakes in the lower 48 states. That's not a great lake, and one of the more beautiful ones I, we think. And this is that's what that view is what drew my wife and I up here <laughs> in retirement because I can't imagine what that view would cost in California. Uh, town name is Hope. It's near the largest, uh, the only town of any size real nearby is Sand Point, which is uh, a resort area, obviously, because of the lake and there's a ski resort right outside of uh, Sand Point here. Nearest town of any size is Coeur d'Alene down on I-90. I'm, I'm north of the northernmost interstate in the United States. 
almost Canada. Anybody else? Anything else? Well, thanks so much for joining today. Please let me know when you have questions. And I hope to see you in another session soon. You're, uh, presumably, you're getting those emails that Mary is sending out to everybody uh, every uh, Monday, listing all of the uh, sessions each week. I'm running about one to two sessions each week for the rest of the semester, at least into, the, into May. And I'll look forward to seeing you. Thank you for coming and bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you.